In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Christ is in our midst. He was, and is, and ever shall be. This morning's gospel parable, let's just face it, is terrifying. It's awful. It has a very critical and dark tone to it. However, we Orthodox Christians, when we come across the, we read the scriptures and we listen to the scriptures, we listen to its entirety. We listen to the ones that are hopeful and upbeat and the ones that are very joyful, such as with the resurrection and, the, and with Pentecost and with the beautiful things that St. Paul says. But also when we come to them in the liturgical year, we also read the ones that are a little tough, the ones that cut us to the heart, and the ones that wake us up. Now, we do this because we know that God loves us, and that God chastens those whom He loves, and that part of a loving relationship that God has with us is that He says things that are good and hopeful and helpful, and also part of that is there are things that are tough for us to hear. Now, what is the general message of this gospel? Well, first of all, that God has a big expectation of his people. God has an expectation of us as his people. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to repent. He wants us to learn to love God and to love our fellow man and to share God's holy way of life and to respect God and, and others around us and to share God's good. But this is, the, uh, this is the other implied expectation that God has of us. He talks in this parable today about a vineyard and about grapes. And what are they going to do with those grapes? They make wine. And so the expectation, the spiritual expectation that God has of us is that we will become first intoxicated, spiritually intoxicated. That's not my image. That's the image in the, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, when they, at the Pentecost, they described those who were witnessing what was going on, described the Christians as being intoxicated. We are called to be intoxicated ourselves with the joy and the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy and the good that God has done to us. And then we are to receive all of these things and be intoxicated as a community and then to go and spiritually intoxicate the world around us in a good way. You know when I say intoxicate, I'm not saying go and become drunk and become fools, but to be noble, dignified people who know how to live life and understand both the joys that we have and both the and also the the hard things that we that we encounter and together with with God we have this beautiful life now before we go into the parable of the gospel today i want to spend a few moments about the context of this gospel of this parable because this parable when the when Jesus said it, and when the people heard it, they had the parable of the vineyard from the Gospel of Isaiah in mind. So just as a recap, uh, in Isaiah's vision, this is chapter 5, if you'd like to go and read it later on. In Isaiah chapter 5, God plants a vineyard, he places a wall around it, he plants in it the choicest grapevines, he gives them a wine press to make wine. He entrusts it to his friends uh, to work the fields and to produce good grapes. But in this parable in Isaiah, instead of good grapes, God is angered and disappointed because he was expecting good grapes. And instead it says that wild grapes, bitter grapes, and thorns Came out instead. Now, the owner of this vineyard is God. We can understand this. The workers of the field are the priests and the kings and individual Jews. The vineyard is Israel, 
which God created to bring good wine, good work, to intoxicate the world around it, not just for the Jewish people, but eventually God, through Israel, was going to go around and save the entire world, all men who would come to the knowledge of the truth. The effort that was put into the vineyard represents God's efforts on behalf of Israel to make Israel good, faithful, repentant servants, such as the law that he gave, the prophets that he sent, the worship that he taught them how to worship. And through all of these things, God would cultivate his chosen people. Now, what do the wild grapes represent? The wild grapes represent infidelity of Israel. They represent the collective sins of the individuals of Israel. They represent apostasy. They represent idolatry. They represent the cheating that the people did on their God by cavorting with foreign gods. For those who remember the Bible, we learned that Israel even though they had this great gift of their life with God, they, they didn't want that. They wanted to be like the other nations, it said. They wanted to be par powerful like the Persians. They wanted the great pyramids like the Egyptians. They wanted the wealth like the Phoenicians. And this was against everything that God created Israel in the first place. God did not create Israel to be like the world, and to be like the fallen world, God created Israel to be a holy nation. That is to be separate from the wicked world around them. The whole point of Israel and the whole point of the Orthodox Christian Church is to be set apart from the world. Not to imitate the world, not to long to be like everyone else we see around them, but to be God's holy chosen, set-apart people. Now, concluding Isaiah, what did God do in response to the wild grapes? It says in this, in this vision that God said he would make a ruin of the vineyard. He would let it go desolate. He did not want anything to do with it. Now, this, this does not mean that God abandoned his people. What it does mean is that God allowed Israel to experience the consequences of their sins, to let the people experience the calamity that came by their infidelity from God and what they would experience by cavorting with the world around them. And God allowed this to happen so that the people would come to their senses, turn around, and again, walk with God as faithful, as a faithful nation. Now, moving to the parable that we have in this morning's gospel. There are some things that Jesus repeats, and there are some things that Jesus adds to Isaiah's vision. Again, when the people were hearing this, when Jesus was talking, they had Isaiah's vision in mind. Now, there are similar things in this morning's gospel. There's a vineyard, there's an owner of the vineyard, there is a hedge planted around it, there is a wine press to make wine, there are, there are vines, there is an expectation of good fruit, and also there is uh, the, 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 this fact that the workers of the vines fell short of the expectations of God. Now what's different? In this, in this gospel, it, uh, Jesus mentions a tower being built. This tower represents the temple in Jerusalem. That temple that was famous to the world around it, that stood above the holy city, that was the focus of all, that was given by God to be present among his people, and that the, however, the workers of the temple forgot God. Because he's actually speaking to the priests, the Pharisees, the scribes in this temple. He's giving this parable to them. They're the workers who went and killed the messengers. And they're the workers that went and killed 
the, the only begotten son, right? So the owner also sends messengers. This is a new part in this parable. The, the messengers represent prophets who speak on behalf of the owner. They also come to collect rents, to collect the good fruit that would become out of this, that, was, that the owner expected to have. And here in this parable, the tenants killed the messengers. Now, almost out of desperation and anger, the owner sends his only son, the de direct representative of the owner, and he assumes that the workers of that field would listen and respect and follow the commands of that son. But what did the tenants do in this parable? They devised the plan to kill the son in order to take over the inheritance, take over the field, and keep it for themselves. Now in today's law, I'm not a lawyer, but in, what I understand about the law, in today's law, this would be called first degree murder with special circumstances that are deserving of the death penalty. Now notice Jesus asked the Pharisees and the scribes here, what do you think in this parable should happen to this wick, these wicked vine dressers? And it says, and the, they said, they, these people deserve the ultimate justice. They deserve death. Now, this is a terrible and fearful, even awful parable. And it also gives a terrible, piercing prophecy of our Lord Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Because we know that God sent His only Son to help Israel and to generously sit, set the nation on the right path to salvation. But they took Jesus outside of the city and killed Him. Now in conclusion, how are we to receive this parable? We are to receive this parable spiritually and to apply it to ourselves, to nobody else but ourselves. Are we working the field as we have been entrusted to? Are we bringing about good fruit, good wine that we can use to be intoxicated with by God's generosity ourselves and to spread the generosity around the world and this intoxication around the world? Or are we rejecting or killing the messengers that God in his, in his long-suffering sends to us? Are we producing good grapes? Are we ever and ever more and more becoming more faithful to God, to his will? Are we seeking chastity? Are we seeking peace? Are we trying to repent? Are we respecting God and his messengers and others around us? Are we showing mercy? Are we showing good? Hmm. Now, God will never abandon us. God chastises his people because he loves them. He says sometimes tough messages for us to hear so that we will wake up and that we will come to our senses and they will become tighter in our spiritual lives as individuals and also tighter as a community united to this mission of God doing good works among his people and among the world so that he can create a new nation. What is the church called? What do we sing about over and over at Easter? We sing New Jerusalem, we call the church. The new Israel. The new chosen people. Let us become fervent, let us become watchful, let us become strong, so that by God's grace and mercy and by our cooperation, we may keep become an ever-fervent people working to do God's work and good work in the world.